Romans chapter 6 from verses 1 to 11. Romans 6, 1 to 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like him like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. May God bless to you that portion of his word. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, I pray that you take this portion of your word and that you would use it to speak into our lives and by your Spirit work that change that is needed in us. Amen. Young people, I first want to start off by telling you about this gentleman. His name is John Newton. Okay, quite a cool dude. Okay, lived a long time ago. Um, He was the author of a very famous hymn. Does anybody know the most famous hymn that John Newton wrote? One of the parents, maybe you know? What? Amazing Grace! All the Welsh people know and they can sing it to us uh, so easily. Yes, Amazing Grace! As a teenager, about Nathaniel's age, or maybe Darby, Jack, he was younger than you, he joined the crew of a ship Unfortunately, it was a slave ship and Newton, as a young man, became part of the most brutal industry that our world has ever known, the slave trade. Transporting people who were captured in Africa uh, and then placed onto sailing ships and taken to the Caribbean and to the West Indies. The conditions on board the slave ships were absolutely horrendous. The slaves were treated worse than cattle. Chained up together, they couldn't move, they just had to lie there for the whole uh, voyage. The sailors on the ships, like young John Newton, very quickly became hard uh, towards the job that they did. It was a gruesome work that they did and soon they lost feelings uh, about the people that they were mistreating. Well, after Newton worked on a slave ship for a while, he himself, when he was on the coast of West Africa, he got captured and he became a slave himself. Crazy. He became the slave of the African wife of a white slave trader. And now it was his turn to be beaten and mistreated. So you imagine he'd been mistreating slaves. Now he was a slave and he didn't get any food so he was forced to eat the garbage from the household to catch rats, okay, to eat them and uh, to live on roots that he dug up at night uh, in the forest, in the, in the bush. Well, after a, a time he managed to escape and get out of the clutches of these people 
and he lived on the west coast of Africa, still working in the slave trade, and he worked himself up until he became the captain of his own ship, yes, a slave ship. And then one day, he was uh, going back and, uh, uh, to England, where he came from, and it was the year 1748, and there was a storm at sea, and the ship was going to sink, and it was then that John Newton called out to Jesus. He realized what a wicked man he was. He realized that he, he, if he was going to drown, he'd go to hell. And he cried out to Jesus to save him. And John Newton was converted. He was changed. Uh, he was completely a different person. He realized he could no longer work in the slave trade, and he stopped and he got a different job. Later on, while he was in England, he went and he studied theology, became a minister of the gospel. And then along with a man in Parliament by the name of William Wilberforce, uh, Newton was one of the greatest advocates to bring about an end to slavery. And praise God, they were successful in the end. But of course, as I said at the beginning, we know him for his other gift, hymn writing. He wrote literally hundreds and hundreds of hymns. Uh, he even wrote uh, hymns in the name of friends of his uh, a quite interesting man, and we, we know the hymn, Amazing Grace. But if you go to the burial place of John Newton, you'll see his gravestone. And on his gravestone we have the story of his life. I wonder if you can read it. Um, it says there, John Newton, clock because that's the job he got after uh, he got out of the slave trade. Once an infidel and libertine, libertine means you don't have any rules, you just do as you care, a servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, in other words, God kept his life, restored, God changed his life, pardoned, that's forgiven, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. What an amazing story. And I encourage you, Google him, find out more about this very interesting man. And this is the subject, the big subject of Romans chapter 6. It's about lives that are changed that are restored, that are renewed by God's grace. And in the section, in the beginning of the section, Paul refers to baptism. He uses baptism as a picture of what God has done in us. Three times uh, he uses the word to baptize. And uh, for those of you that speak the English, I learned my English from a book, <laughs> uh, those of you that speak English will know that the word for what happened to these young men is baptize, dope in Netherlands. And the baptize comes from a Greek word. It's not actually translated. It's just a few letters moved around. Baptizo. Guys in the classes learnt a bit about that. And Greek is a very specific language. Words only have one meaning in Greek, and it means very specifically to dip or to put under the water, to immerse under water. Uh, it was the word used for dyeing cloth. So uh, the cloth was baptized into the red or the blue or the green dye, and you had to put it completely under the water, otherwise it wouldn't be dyed properly. It was the word used in the kitchen for washing dishes. Uh, there were different words for that. You can rinse the, the dishes or you can put them under the water and uh, that's what happened to Jack and Nathaniel and to Darby. They were baptizo. They were immersed, all of them, under the water. And Paul reminds the Christians um, in Rome of their baptism. As I said, baptism is a picture a picture of what God has already done in your life. And the reason 
why he's, he's making this point is because some people were saying, well, isn't it wonderful that we're Christians now? Uh, God has forgiven us, and we can just carry on living a wild life of sin because God will just forgive us. So the more we sin, the more grace we get. And Paul says, no way. He says, he uses the strongest terms in verse 2, by no means, meganeto, it will never happen. That's a load of nonsense. No. And I'm going to tell you why. And I want to remind you uh, of your baptism. And so in verse 3, he tells us that you have been, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been baptized into death. Sounds a bit of a uh, harsh thing to say. But what he's saying is that when you get baptized, you are baptized into the death of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means that you identify yourself with the death of Jesus on the cross. You are declaring, Darby and Jack and Nathaniel, you're declaring your faith in the death of Jesus. You're saying, Jesus died for me. It's all very well to say Jesus died for the world, but Jesus died for me, and I'm trusting in him that his death cleanses me from my sin. His death makes me right with God. Now, I wonder if you can tell me how do people identify? How do Manchester United followers or I know it's not a good team, I know that, but how do they identify with their team? If you were, by some strange error of judgment, a fan of Manchester United, anybody, how would you identify with Manchester United? What would you do? You'd wear a Man United shirt, that horrible red thing, yes. Anybody here Man United fans? Any? Yeah, there's one at the back. Give that man a shirt. <laughs> okay. Springbok rugby supporters, how do they identify with the Boca? What's that? With? With? We have a bride. <laughs> but some of them will wear a green Springbok jersey or the cap or something like that. We show our love for our team. We identify with them. Well, in a sense, baptism involves an identification with Jesus. At a deeper level, it's more than just you are like Jesus or shouting for Jesus. Um, let me try and explain it like this. I can go to the shop called Solo. Anybody know Solo? Folk in the Netherlands know the shop Solo. And I can buy an army uniform. Okay, I was walking in Leiden uh, the other day and I saw a, a, a shop that sells second-hand army uniforms. You get them all over the, the world. And I can buy an army uniform. Maybe I like the army, okay? The army is nice. Who wouldn't like to be in a uniform, okay? Um, I want to be a soldier, okay? But just because I've bought a uniform and I wear a uniform, does that make me a soldier? If I'm wearing a uniform, does that make me a soldier, yes or no? No, of course not. You need to be accepted by the army. Usually they have some kind of medical requirement, some time, kind of intelligence requirement, that's probably why I would never, and, and an age requirement, no doubt. You then need to get some training, and you must be, you know, pass that training to be fully authorized as a soldier of a particular army, and then when you put on the uniform, it means so much more, doesn't it? Then you are identifying with the military that you're serving. And, and baptism, guys, is like the uniform of the Christian soldier. 
through baptism, you have put on the uniform of the Christian soldier. You are identifying with Jesus. You are identifying with his death on the cross. Paul goes on to say that we also identify not only with the death of Jesus, but with the burial of Jesus. The Bible says that we were buried with him in baptism. And just for the... I said to Darby and Nathaniel, when I hold them under the water for five minutes, um, and they didn't bat an eyelid, they said, yeah, fine. Um, In that moment that you're under the water, you're identifying with the burial of Jesus. In other words, you're saying, I've repented of my sin, that my old sinful life, it's buried, it's gone, it's, it's like a dead body uh, in the ground. And that means something as well. It means that when we put our faith in Jesus and we're following Jesus, there has to be a change. There needs to be a change in our lives. Uh, we can't just stay the same. Our old sinful past is dead and buried. We now have a new life to live. And that brings me to the next picture uh, in baptism, which in verse 5 is new life in Jesus. Look at verse 5. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united in a resurrection like his. So let me go through those pictures. When a person is baptized, They go into the water. That's a picture of the death of Jesus, but that's also a picture that you've died to your old life. When you're under the water, that's a picture of the burial of Jesus, but it's also a picture that your old life is over. Coming out of the water with great joy is a picture of new life. You are identifying with the resurrection of Jesus and the eternal life that he has given to you. You're declaring that I am a new creation. I have received eternal life in Jesus Christ. And all this happens when you come to faith in Jesus, when the Holy Spirit applies the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus to you personally. Now if we go on to verses 6 and 7, we see that Paul explains a little bit how this happens. He says, your old self, was crucified with Jesus. The old self is, the Bible teaches it's a little bit complicated, but we inherited this old self from Adam. It's who we were and how we lived before we became followers of Jesus. Now this old self is dead, okay? It's buried, it's gone. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Do you notice what's been crucified? The I. Eh? In other words, my selfish me has been crucified. It's, it, I don't live uh, for me anymore, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so as I round things up, I want to ask, well, what does this look like? What does this new life look like? Eh? Uh, What does it involve? Well, Paul explains in verses 6 and 7. The first thing he says is that you're no longer a slave. Remember John Newton with the slaves in the ship? He says in verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. If you're on that slave ship and you died, okay, and old John Newton and his mates threw your body overboard, you were no longer a slave. You were free, okay? You were dead, but you were free. (laughs) That's the picture uh, that he has. Of course, We are made alive in Jesus and we're still free. 
The Holy Spirit, as it were, rescues us from that horrible plantation of sin with that nasty master uh, that's in charge of it. And he takes us out of that and he puts us and he plants us in the kingdom of Jesus. And now we are free, free to follow the ways of Jesus. Now some of you young people might have a question at this point. Well, if I'm free to follow the ways of Jesus, if I'm dead to sin, why do I still sin? Eh? Why do I still mess up? Eh? Why does that happen? If we've been set free from the slavery of sin, well, let me use the picture of a slave. For a slave who was set free, it would often take some time before they understood what it was like to live like a free person, especially somebody who was born into slavery. Uh, their parents were slaves and they were born on that slave plantation and they were just lived in that. Sometimes if they were free and they saw somebody who looked like the old slave master, the former slave would get very frightened and they'd run and they hide. Of course they hate the old life of slavery. They hate it. They don't like it at all. But it still haunts them. Sometimes at night they have those dreams of being whipped and all the things that went on. And they need to learn to live their new life free, free, free as a free person. They need the example of other free people to show them this is how you live as a free person. And it's exactly the same for those who are free in Jesus. Jesus has not finished his work with us. There's still a lot of work uh, for us to understand what it is to live in him. And that work is going to be completed. Don't worry. The day is coming when you stand before him in heaven and he welcomes you to himself. Then uh, that job will be completed. In the meantime, we still have a bit of a struggle. We struggle daily with sin. Like the slave, you've got to hate that sin. Uh, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. You need the Bible. You need other Christians to help you fight against it and to live a holy life. And then the last thing is in verse 11 that I want to point out today. Consider yourself dead to sin. Consider yourself. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ Jesus. That's an interesting word, consider. It means to think about it. It means to uh, make a mental list, to record and remind yourself of something. My wife isn't here at the moment. She's looking after our grandchild and my daughter. But... Um, it happens even when she's here. When I go shopping, I have to make a shopping list. Okay, gentlemen, I think you would agree with me. And so I write down the list of the things that I need. I need eggs, I need milk, I need bread, and I need fruit, I need vegetables. Okay, if I don't, I know what I'll come back with. I'll come back with eggs and chocolate and chips and cake. Okay, maybe drop because I'm here in the Netherlands. Those of you who don't, don't come from the Netherlands, you don't know what drop is. Uh, it's like they don't know what cheese is either. Okay. Uh, speak to a Dutchman if you want to know what drop is. It's the most wonderful invention in the world. The saltier, uh, the, the, the better. Okay. I need that list. And I, I used to try just keeping the list in my mind, but I get distracted, eh? I, I, I go past the, 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 the sweet section and I spend all my time there when I should be by the meat and the eggs and the vegetables and uh, that sort of thing. So now I take my little piece of paper with my list and it's the same for your walk with Jesus. You need to remind yourself that you're changed, <laughs> that you're free. You need to believe, even write down what the Bible has said, that you're a new creature. 
and that you need to act on that. Instead of the old shopping list of pride and envy and anger and selfishness, we need a new shopping list from Jesus and from the New Testament. Love and joy and peace, humility, kindness, self-control. That needs, guys, to be on your list. The other day, I turned on my computer as normal, and you know what happens when you turn on your computer? It sort of goes through that startup, and it starts with the default settings. And I wasn't too happy with the settings because somehow my eyes are not what they used to be, so the font was a bit too small. And I went into the settings and I changed some of the settings and then I turned my computer off and then the next morning it came back just the same. Okay, nothing had changed because I realized, I spoke to my son because he is the boffin of all things and he said, Dad, you need to go into the settings and you need to change the default. I said, spell that for me, please. <laughs> and I did that and now when I turn the computer off it comes on, comes on and the defaults have changed. The font setting is bigger, the, the light is brighter, everything has changed and it's a permanent change. I want to say the default setting for all people when they come into this world is called sinful nature. We follow in that default. When we become a Christian, baptism is a picture of this, the default mode is reset. It's reset to Jesus' default. Baptism, guys, is a picture and a reminder of this total reset. And now, every morning when you wake up, you wake up as a new person in Jesus. And your task each day is to maintain that status. Yes, there are times when you muck up and like me, you know, I press alt control and something else and goes blub, blub, blub. Um, yes, we do. We need to fight against the pressures of the world, against the devil, against our non-Christian friends that tell us to go in the wrong way, against our own selfish nature. But we've been set free from that. We don't have to live in it. And it's not just negative. It's not just saying no, there's so much positive. We need that list, the reminder of the new set of defaults. Each day we start up, we need to go through the changes that God has made in our lives. I am a new person. I don't have to be selfish. I don't have to be angry. I can be kind. I can really love people because Jesus has loved me. And baptism is a picture and a testimony that those changes have taken place. Baptism doesn't make the changes. The Holy Spirit, God makes the changes. He takes you out of sin. He takes you out of the control of sin. He puts you in Jesus. And baptism is the testimony to the fact that the Holy Spirit has placed you in Jesus. And today three young men declared that, that they are in Jesus. They are joined to Jesus that they have received for themselves the death, the burial, and resurrection of sin, of, of, of Christ. They are dead, dead to sin. They've buried the old sinful nature, and they are living a new life in Christ. And I want to encourage you in the congregation to pray for them. Pray for them. Encourage them. Come alongside them. But what about the rest of us? got to make it personal for you. First of all, there's somebody here today who needs to turn from your sin and you need to trust in Jesus. You know who you are. I don't know who you are, but you're out there. Uh, you need to be set free from the slavery of sin. Uh, very often we're slaves and we don't know it, okay? You just look in the mirror and get to know what's in your heart and then you realize, oh, Yes, 
That is the most important thing a person can ever do in their entire life, to call out to Jesus. You can do that today. Call out to Jesus. Receive his death and receive from him new life. That's the first thing. The second thing is though there are those of you that have done that, to put your trust in Jesus, but you've never uh, made a public declaration of your faith in Jesus. You need to do that as well. Uh, you need to do that by being baptized. That's the only way the Bible says we can do that. And I encourage you, don't put off that step of obedience. Obey Jesus. And then lastly, for the rest of us, we need to remind ourselves every day of the changes that God has done for us. Daily remind yourself of the change from sin and self to love and joy and peace and humility and kindness and self-control. And you will see the difference that God will do in your life. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Shall we pray? Our gracious Father, we thank you for your work that you've done in Jack's life. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done in Darby's life. We thank you, Lord God, for the work that you've done in Nathaniel's life. We thank you too, Father, for their families, for the environment where, as Jack was saying, he grew up hearing Bible stories all the time. Lord, there are countless people in this world that have never heard a single passage from the Bible. We were praying for the people of Niger. Lord, we do pray for the spread of your word and the spread of the gospel, that more people will be able to hear of the glorious, wonderful good news of Jesus. Lord, it's so easy in a sense for us. Uh, it becomes just ordinary. But we realize, Lord, it is supernatural. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I praise you for the work that you've done in these young men. I pray that you'd strengthen them. I pray that you'd give them boldness. I pray that you'd fill them with your love, with your joy, with your peace, with your kindness, with your self-control. Lord, that you'd use them not only to encourage us, but Lord, to share the good news of Jesus with others. And then, Lord, I want to pray for that person who needs to turn to you. Lord, as you are drawing them, I pray that you would open their heart to receive you, that they too can receive your forgiveness and your new life. In your precious name I pray. Amen.